Occultists have always believed in the existence of a universal energy. Yogans believe in such an energy, the Chinese and Japanese believe in it, and so do members of virtually every tribal cult. Up through the 19th century, physicists commonly believed that there was no such thing as purely empty space. Rather, they thought the whole universe was permeated with an energetic substance called ether. At the same time, biologists believed in the existence of a life force. Not many biologists were willing to speculate on that whether this life force was related to ether, but they did think the force existed. Pasteur, for example, placed great emphasis on the role of this force, which he called Elan Vital. Ironically, it was Pasteur's experiments and spontaneous generation that gave the theory of the life force its single greatest setback. By the beginning of the 20th century, both ether and the life force were pretty much dead concepts for scientists. Biologists were convinced that they could explain life entirely in physiochemical terms. Today we're going to examine the lost works of Wilhelm Reich. Reich was the son of a farmer. He was born in 1897, grew up in the Ukrainian part of Austria, and served in the Austrian army from 1915 to 1918. After the war, he moved to Vienna and entered the Faculty of Medicine. There he began to read Freud. In his enthusiasm, he organized psychoanalytic study groups, then he began to correspond with members of Freud's circle. These people soon recognized Reich's talents, and at the very young age of 23, he became a member of the Vienna Psychoanalytic Society. One of the things that had most excited Reich about psychoanalysis was Freud's libido theory. This was the concept of a specific sexual energy, something like an electric current. Freud had spoken of this biological energy as a source of all activity, indeed as the basis of human personality. Reich took all of this literally. He believed the origin of anxiety lay in sexual stasis, a block in the flow of libido. Such a block could exist even in people who seem to be sexually active. Neurotics, especially neurotic males, are often able to achieve orgasm, but they cannot feel genuine, complete pleasure. Something is always lacking for them, so they go on repeating the same actions joyously and habitually in the search of satisfaction. Nobody can be happy, Reich said, without orgastic potency. This ability not merely to reach orgasm, but to enjoy it fully. As Reich's biographer, David Boadella, explains, orgastic potency is the capacity to surrender the flow of biological energy without any inhibition, the capacity for complete discharge of all damned up sexual excitation through involuntary pleasurable contractions of the body. Reich presented this theory well. He argued persuasively and clearly for it, drawing on many fine clinical observations, but he put forward the theory at a very bad time. Just as he was insisting on the literal biological truth of Freud's theory, Freud was moving away from biology toward a theory of instincts. The psychoanalytic society went along with Freud. When Reich insisted on holding on to his own theories, he met not only indifference but hostility. The animosity that grew against him in the society would eventually be ruinous to him. All this time, Reich was still working as a psychoanalyst. In 1928, he became vice director of the Psychoanalytic Polyclinic. The clinic offered free treatment to the poor, and so Reich began to treat people who were vastly different from the usual psychoanalytic patients. He became intimately acquainted with the troubles of the working people, especially their sexual troubles and he began to ask questions that no other psychoanalyst had bothered to ask. What exactly do you do when you make love? How do you start? How long does it last? What do you feel? What do you think about when you're doing it? Do you masturbate? Right-handed or left-handed? And in what room of the house? Eventually, Reich began to give counseling to poor people on everyday problems, partly because of his political convictions. During this period, he was a member of the Communist Party. To carry out his goals, he set up the Socialist Society for Sex Consultation and Sexological Research, where he gave advice on birth control, sexual problems, marital problems, and methods of child rearing. 
The clinic was open to unmarried people and adolescents, which was a scandal at that time. More and more, his colleagues in Vienna snubbed him. He had become a great embarrassment to them. So Reich moved to Berlin. In 1931, with the help of the German Communist Party, he set up the German Association for Proletarian Sexual Politics. His program included the abolition of anti-abortion laws, distribution of free contraceptives, the abolition of legal distinction between married and unmarried people, and a drive to eliminate prostitution and venereal diseases. This was the period of Reich's greatest political activity. He had perceived that sexual repression and political repression go together, that capitalism keeps working people not only economically impoverished, but sexually impoverished. The working people whom he treated often could not fully enjoy sex because they were worn down from laboring to make a subsistence wage. As for the politicians and businessmen, they preached that sex was bestial and, sin and shameful while they quietly made profits from the pornography trade. Nor did it look if things would get better. The Nazis and fascists were ten times worse than the old capitalists. The Nazis, for their part, did not like Reich either. He was a Jew, a communist, and he wanted people to enjoy sex. In March of 1933, Reich had to flee to Austria. Now the full burden of the hostility of the Vienna Psychoanalytic Society came down on him. His colleagues did not regard him as a hero and a refugee. They thought him as a bother, and some went so far as to bait him publicly. The International Psychoanalytic Press, which had contracted to publish his Reich's book on character analysis, canceled his contract. Reich had to borrow money and have the book printed privately. He could not go on living in such a situation. Besides, the Nazi threat to Austria was too great. On May 1st, 1933, he left Vienna. For the next year, he wandered homelessly in Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. His colleagues ostracized him. The police harassed him. For a while, he had to live under an assumed name. And finally, he found refuge in Oslo. He lived there until 1939, when he immigrated to America. In 1931, he began the research that would occupy him for the rest of his life. His findings would be so extraordinary that they would cause Albert Einstein to say that they threatened to overthrow all of physics. Bions in the Oregon Through his clinical work, Reich had developed the concept of muscle armor. Every emotional block, he said, has a corresponding physical block. Certain sets of muscles become tense and inflexible. They restrict movement, breath, feeling. No biological energy can flow through them. It seemed to Reich that if this theory was true, he should be able to test it. He would set up a device to measure the electrical current of the skin. He went to considerable trouble and expense to build such an apparatus, but it was worth it. He confirmed the body has a continuous bioelectric field that varies with different emotional states. What might be the next step in the study of flow of energy? Reich thought he was ought to study the flow of protoplasm in one-celled organisms. So he obtained the necessary equipment and began to prepare a culture of amoeba and paramecia in textbook fashion. He left some hay soaking in clear water for 10 to 14 days. Protozoal spores were supposed to float from the air into the hay infusion and grow there. Something in that procedure bothered Reich. There were no protozoa in the hay. There were none in the water. How could he be sure that the protozoa really came from the air? To check on it, he put the hay infusion under a high-powered microscope, rigged a camera to the eyepiece, and took time-lapse photos while the hay soaked. He discovered that the little sacs formed on the hay and then broke away and floated into the water. The sacs tended to gather in a heap in which they would move rhythmically, pulsating as a group. Were these elementary life forms? For his next infusions, Reich carefully sterilized all of his materials. The results actually increased. He added protein and cholesterol to his infusions. There was still more activity. He removed the little sacks from the water and put them onto culture media. They grew. By now, Reich was convinced he had come across a primitive life form. He called it the bion. 
In 1939, Reich took up residence in Forest Hills, Long Island and joined the New School for Social Research as an associate professor of medical psychology, and he continued his research into the bion. He'd found that bions of a certain shape would cause cancer when injected into mice. When he cut open the tumors of these mice, he found them swarming with bions of the same shape. He called these bions T. bacilli, and T would be for Todd or death. Certain other bions were luminescent. They gave off radiation that seemed to counteract the T. bacilli. Obviously, his next task was to investigate this radiation. In so doing, he stumbled upon his most important discovery, the existence of orgone energy. The story of this discovery is one of the strangest in history of science. Reich wanted to have an insulated box in which to put his sample groups of radiating bions. So he built a sheet metal box and lined it on the outside with wood. The materials were quite ordinary and the design was plain. The only thing that was unusual was that the box glowed in the dark. Reich was not the sort of man to let a phenomenon like that to go unexamined. He called in other observers. They saw a glow in the empty box as well. Perhaps he thought the light was in their eyes rather than in the box, so he performed a simple control experiment. He had them spend some time staring at a completely dark room. They saw what they expected to see. Nothing. This was still not enough for Reich. He wanted a completely reliable observer. He chose Albert Einstein. Einstein went to Reich's lab, saw the box glow in the dark, and confirmed that he too saw the light. But Einstein would neither comment or speculate on the phenomenon. It was at this time he said that Reich's discovery threatened to overthrow physics. But Reich wasn't all that concerned with the theoretical implications of his finding. He was now certain that the box concentrated a universal energy. He called it orgone energy, and that this force could help people. He built an organ accumulator large enough for someone to sit in, and he began to study its effects. He found that his subject's body temperature rose when they were in the box. Some said it gave them pins and needles. Others experienced an increased sensitivity to light. One woman said the experience was comparable to orgasm. In all cases, a period of sitting increased the strength and flow of biological energy. This was a breakthrough. Reich felt that the picture was now complete. There was a universal force, orgone energy, that strengthened biological energy, or perhaps that was biological energy. This same orgone energy was what made bions form organic compounds. Furthermore, orgone energy was useful in the treatment of diseases, including cancer. When Reich added that piece of information to his other findings, he was ready to formulate his general theory that the blockage of bioenergy causes 1. A lack of sexual interest and satisfaction 2. Emotional emptiness 3. Deep muscle tension, areas of which may become cancerous 4. Poor respiration 5. Devitalized skin with the skin's electrical charge lowered 6 the tendency of blood to disintegrate in certain clinical tests. In 1948, Reich published his findings in The Cancer Biopathy. At this stage, he had independent, positive confirmation of his findings. There had been such confirmation of his research all along. He had, in fact, completely fulfilled the prime rule of scientific research. His experiments were repeatable and had been verified. The cancer biopathy received very favorable reviews. From this time on, Reich, who proved that he deserved serious attention and respect for his contributions to science, received persecution and it gradually destroyed him. Starting in 1947, inaccurate and sometimes slanderous articles about Reich's work began to appear in such periodicals as Harper's, The New Republic, and the Journal of American Medical Association. A typical claim of these art articles was that the orgone accumulator was designed to activate masturbation. At first, these attacks were merely an annoyance, but then the investigators from the Food and Drug Administration began to visit Reich's 
Research Institute. They were already convinced that Reich was doing something dirty, and they seemed to get cheap thrills by poking around the Institute. They asked whether the patients sat in the orgone box naked and how many women used the box. One investigator blurted, what do you do with the women? Eventually, the Food and Drug Administration's hard work had its effect. A court ordered Reich for, uh, to stop giving orgone treatments and to stop accepting money for the sale of his literature or rental of his accumulators. Reich had fled the Nazis, faced opposition from his closest colleagues, and finally established a whole new life in America. Now the United States government, in which he believed deeply, was persecuting, and he broke under the strain. He'd begun experimenting with devices for weather control early in the 1950s. Now he converted one of those devices into what he called a space gun. He did so because he knew UFOs were visiting us. The UFOs were powered by orgone energy and they carried core men or cosmic orgone energy men. The UFOs were poisoning our air, he said, and he was firing at them with his space gun. The question of the existence and mission of UFOs is irrelevant here. The plain fact was that Reich had become paranoid. In 1956, he began to speculate that he himself was from outer space. He wondered if his children were the beginning of a new interplanet interplan interplanetary race. That same year, Reich was tried for contempt of court for having ignored the injunction against his work. His violation of the injunction had been minor. Some materials had gone out of his institute and rental money for the accumulators was still trickling in. For this infraction, the Wilhelm Reich Foundation had to pay a fine of $10,000 and Reich was sentenced to a jail term of two years. The FDA destroyed all the orgone accumulators they had found at the Institute. They burned all of Reich's books they could get their hands on. Reich died in Danbury Federal Correction Institution on November 2, 1957. The Power of Odin Wilhelm Reich was not the first Westerner to stumble upon the existence of universal life energy. In the middle of the 19th century, a German industrialist and scientist named Baron Karl von Reichenbach encountered the same phenomenon. He called it the Ode Force after the Norse god Odin. Reichenbach said there was positive Ode, which was a yellowish red, and negative Ode, which was blue. People radiate positive ode on the left sides of their bodies and negative ode on the right. You can feel the effects of ode quite easily. Get a bar magnet, hold your left hand over one end of it for a few minutes. The hand should be from two to six inches over the magnet. Then hold your hand over the magnet's other pole. You may find the magnet's north pole, negative ode, gives your left hand a cool, refreshing feeling. The positive south pole will feel warm and somewhat unpleasant. There's also an experiment you can try if you have access to a completely dark room. Place a bar magnet or flowering plant in the room, then wait. Very sensitive people usually have to sit in the dark for only an hour. Less sensitive people must wait up to four hours. Eventually though, you will see ode flaming from the magnet or the plant.